This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Gnosis, an open platform for businesses to create their own prediction market applications on top of the Ethereum network. They recently launched Gnosis X, a challenge inviting developers to build apps on top of the Gnosis platform. To learn more, go to epicenter.tv slash Gnosis X. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving the decentralized technology and cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Meher Roy. And my name is Sunny Agarwal. And today we have with us two guests from the Zillica project. With us today are Amrit Kumar, who is the co-founder and head of research at Zillica, and Ilya Sergey, a assistant professor at the University College London. So let's go ahead and start off with some backgrounds. Um, Amrit, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the blockchain space? Before everything, you know, hello to everyone. And, uh, you know, it's great to be back here. So, uh, yeah, I'm um, working with Zilliqa right now. And before that, I was uh, I did a PhD in, uh, in computer security and privacy at INRIA. And then I came over to Singapore at National University of Singapore, where I did a postdoc for around a year. And where I started to explore blockchains, especially from the privacy perspective. So uh, I was uh, interested in uh, Monero, which, uh, you know, which was one of the privacy-friendly uh, and privacy enhancing uh, cryptocurrencies. And we tried to analyze how, how much privacy it gives in practice. So this is how I got introduced into blockchain. And then one day, um, my advisor at uh, NUS uh, asked me if I was interested in, in building a scalable blockchain platform called Zilliqa. And this is, this is how I, I, I jumped into Zilliqa. Great. And Ilya, how about you? How did you get involved with the space? All right. First of all, great pleasure to be here. It's my first time and I'm about to enjoy it here. All right, so uh, my background is in formal methods and uh, programming language theory. So I did my PhD in uh, Catholic University of Leuven, that's in Belgium, and then I was a postdoc in IMDA Software Institute, and then I took this position as an assistant professor, or lecturer, as they call it, at University College London. So uh, since uh, during most of my research career, I was looking at the properties of programs that, as we all know, can be buggy as hell and can go wrong. So I was looking for ways to prove programs behaving correctly, being secure, uh, and obeying certain properties. Uh, applications of blockchain technology, specifically around 2015 when Ethereum started to emerge, seems like, seemed like a super exciting area where lots of research in PL theory and formal methods can be applied. So since then, I start to look at, at this thinking about how can we possibly write safe and secure applications that run on top of this uh, distributed architecture, what are the properties that we are interested in, and finally, what are the right programming language mechanism to express those sorts of computations and those sorts of properties. And this is how uh, we ended up collaborating with Zilliqa that I'm currently advising, and we jointly are designing and building uh, Scylla as a programming language on top of the Zilliqa platform. Awesome, cool. So, um, Amrit, so you know, you guys were on Epicenter in the past about, uh, I think, November of last year. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit, uh, you, and on that last time, you told us a lot about the uh, basics of the protocol. And I think this is like when you guys were like first getting started. Um, could you guys, or when you first went public, maybe, uh, could you guys tell us a little bit more uh, about what are some of the progress and updates uh, that has come to Zillica since the last uh, time you guys were on? Yeah, sure. So, um... Uh, at that point of time, we didn't have Scylla, of course. Uh, we were still working on, um, you know, designing and having a uh, having this idea of how we want our lang language to be. So we have uh, progressed in two different directions. One is, of course, on the Scylla side, where we have, you know, we re released our white paper that explains the design rationale in uh, in for Scylla uh, in January uh, this year. And in parallel, we were working on um, implementing uh, the Zilliqa core protocol. So we are at a stage where, um, I mean, our first testnet has been released. Uh, that testnet allows you, that kind of implements a Bitcoin-like infrastructure where you can do payments. Uh, we have a block explorer and a web wallet that allows people to interact with uh, the backend uh, blockchain infrastructure. Uh, you, you cannot join the network for now, uh, but we are going to open it up very soon. So you, you can become a miner. Um, we still have a lot of things to do. For instance, we have to put gas mechanics and uh, incentive layer that's not there yet, but we are actively working on it. 
Uh, in parallel, we are working on on Scylla uh, together with Ilya, where we are working on uh, designing and implementing the interpreter and uh, the language spec, um, where you know we'll see what kind of primitives the language will provide and support. And recently, we did a demo a couple of days ago, where we demonstrated the first contract um, that uh, that 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 can run on Zilliqa. That was a crowdfunding contract. So yeah, things are things are working pretty pretty well and fast, I would say. But there are lots, lots, lots of things to do. Very cool. Yeah, uh, when I actually uh, first read you guys' paper, I was like super excited because I first like, you know, a lot of people uh, use the word like proof of work and Nakamoto consensus interchangeably. And I always used to bring up to people like, technically you could do proof of work BFT. I've just never seen anyone do it. And it was, it was really cool to see that you guys were actually trying to do proof of work BFT. So. Uh, in your current testnet, do you guys uh, have implemented the sharding mechanism and stuff? Is that like live? Yeah, so uh, we, we have uh, sharding, which is live. So um, the, in the back end, when you send transactions, those transactions get sharded. The network is sharded. So it's not like a big network as in, as in Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, it's, it's sharded. So we have shards uh, built up. And those shards process are only a subset of transactions. So yes, uh, sharding is, is live. That's super cool. Uh, I mean, I personally look forward to joining the testnet when you when you go live with it. So, so this episode is not focused on the sharding mechanism of of uh, Zilliqa, but rather the smart contract language, which is Scylla. And like Ilya, you've you've worked for a long time on programming language theory and software verification, and like. Scrolling through your past papers, I see lots of work with this idea of mechanized proofs. And mechanized proofs will, of course, play a role later on in the conversation when we discuss Scylla. Uh, but before we start on Scylla, could you give us an idea of what is a mechanized proof? All right. Uh, thanks for the question here. So before I actually start talking about mechanized proofs, let me arise the question, what is a proof? And this is rather philosophical. So it turns out that when we talk about proving something, we usually have a certain statement in mind, like a sum of two even numbers is even, for example. That already implies that we have a theory of natural numbers in our head, and we know what uh, an even number means, and we know how the sum is defined. So all these together are the, fact, uh, are the, are the components about which we can make statements. And then there is a notion of logic in which we make the statements. Uh, well, most of the humans, they have certain sense of logic. They know what is true and what is not true. But when we actually try to establish that certain statement is true, i.e. it is correct, we start invoking the rules of the logic. For example, we know if A and B are correct, uh, then either like both A and B are correct separately. So this is like a simple rule that we all have in our he uh, heads. Or we know that if we if A implies B, or and we know A, then B holds too. So all these rules is something that uh, mathematicians uh, started to uh, formalize and spell out in a mathematical system around the end of the 19th century. And this is how the basics of logics have been laid out with many prominent scientists, uh, such as Gödel, such as Church, uh, and, um, and many others. And then uh, there came the notion of a constructive proof. So what are the statements that we can uh, possibly prove? Well, and this largely depends on what the rules we, uh, what, the, uh, what, what rules we use and what are, the, what are the axioms. So most of us are familiar with axioms of planar geometry such that the two parallel lines never intersect. So this is something we take from, from granted. But there are other things that we don't take from granted. We derive from these initial assumptions and we apply those rules. Okay, so now what is the true statement? Well, the true statement actually largely depends on your initial assumptions and on the rules that you use to prove this statement. Uh, and different logics, they come with different set of rules and most of us, they have certain version of constructive logic in our head when we know how to combine facts together so we can derive more composite statements and mathematicians make it uh, precise. So if we uh, can prove certain statement in uh, a logic of choice, then this statement is considered to be a true. And if we cannot prove this statement, it's considered to be a false. So the notion of falsehood is actually the, uh, the whole plethora of statements that cannot be proved. So uh, now approaching the, uh, the idea of mechanized proofs. 
Obviously, most of us heard of proofs that are wrong. A uh, famous example is Fermat's great theorem that has existed for 300 years and only has been, and it's only believed to be proven finally by Andrew Wiles in uh, 1993. So why all the previous attempts were, uh, were unsuccessful? Well, because uh, this sequence of rules that mathematicians used to uh, apply for proving the ultimate statement about the, about the numbers in Fermat's theorem, there were uh, some rules which were applied wrongly, so uh, some rules which were uh, applied out of place. And for example, I'll give you some. So uh, let me tell you that the sum, uh, okay, so the example I gave before, the sum of two even numbers is even. This is something that we sort of believe because we know how numbers function. What if I tell you that the sum of any two numbers is even? Well, you know that it's false and you know it from experience. But if I ask to prove you, uh, you will be probably uh, invoking the definition of natural numbers, the definition of addition, the notion of evenness, the notion of oddity. And at some point when you will try to combine the facts, you'll see that uh, you have no rule to deliver this final statement. So uh, this means that the proof is inconsistent, the proof is wrong. And obviously when we write such proof on, proofs on papers, and the proofs might be about any arbitrary mathematical object. So I use natural numbers as examples, but those might be programs or those might be distributed protocols. So it is often the case that uh, the proofs contain uh, wrongly applied rules. Uh, and this is where the idea of mechanized proof comes to the help. So if we can write a proof as a sequence or rather a tree of applications of rules building our, our the notion of uh, our the notion of to ground up from the axioms by applying more and more and more proofs and maybe reusing the libraries of existing proofs in the way the programmers use the software libraries, then we can delegate the task of checking the validity of such proof to a computer. And this is what the software uh, known as proof assistants or uh, mechanized theorem provers are doing. Uh, they usually do not prove statements automatically. That can be done, but usually for very simple statements or statements within uh, certain theories that are known to have uh, decidable facts. But I, like the world, is, the world is, comp is very complex and most of the theorems, they actually require a human in the loop to construct these proofs. And this is why we still have mathematicians and they are not out of job because humans are required to construct those proofs. But quite frankly, humans are not required to check the proofs. This is something that the computer can do. And if we give the computer the formal system, such as the system of natural numbers, which is where our objects live, we give the statement about certain objects from the system and we give the proof of this statement. Then uh, the software can put all these three things together and check that every single rule in this derivation of the proof has been applied correctly. And then if it says, yes, every single rule is applied correctly and your axioms are good and they are all consistent, uh, then you have the notion of mechanically checking proof. So that is the proof of the statement that you have here. The question is, what if your statement is not good enough? But that's a separate, a separate question. But the mechanized proofs is this idea that the computer can actually check uh, a certain derivation. And that, that can be done automatically. So uh, that's, that's really fascinating, right? So essentially the way I see it is like any programmer at, at some level, uh, they have data and they have functions. And then they use functions to build other functions. And then there is like a hierarchy of um, small functionality that is used to compose something big. And mathematics is similar because like some complex statement like the Fermat's theorem could depend on simpler proofs of other, other simpler things, which depend on proofs of other simpler things, which depend then on axioms that we take for the logic that logical system that we are considering. And so um, whenever, in a sense, the way I understand a mechanic mechanized proof is I could express um, how I'm proving Fermat's last theorem as, a, as, as, as this cascading set of smaller proof statements, give it to a computer, and then the computer will verify the, the whole de derivation of the proof and will uh, give high assurance that that proof is correct. This is very much a correct vision. Thank you. In fact, this analogy that you have just distilled uh, with uh, the libraries of functions that the programmers use and the textbooks of theorems that the mathematician uh, refer to when they actually prove new theorems, uh, this actually has a name. 
Uh, and this is called uh, Carrie Howard correspondence or Carrie Howard isomorphisms. So um, Haskell Carey and uh, Howard are the two um, very famous mathematicians who live in the 20th century. And they noticed this uh, very elegant uh, correspondence between uh, the models of uh, certain classes of programming languages, uh, such as uh, functional programming languages. So these are models that are now empower languages such as OCaml, uh, Haskell, uh, and some others. So, and uh, the idea of mathematical proof in the constructive logic. So it turns out that the statements the mathematicians write, they are very much similar to the types that uh, people give to the programs written in the functional language. So for example, uh, if you have a function that takes an integer and returns a string, you can think of it as of an implication that takes something that is an integer and they gives you something that is a string. So even the symbol is similar, so that's an error. Uh, and that's why this analogy is so powerful and this is why it actually has been very much used in implementation of the proof assistants that now sort of combine proving and programming. So uh, writing a theorem is the very same as writing a type annotation to your function. And proving the theorem uh, is very much similar to implementing this function. It's like you're programming, but your types come before your uh, implementations. So in the programming, it's usually the other way around. So you first write the implementation and you think of the types. And in fact, uh, it shouldn't come as a big surprise that programmers, especially those who are programming languages such as Haskell and OCaml, which have very, very powerful type system, they already do uh, some sort of mechanized theorem proven, uh, even though they might not realize it. So when they uh, make sure that their type program type checks against the types, uh, they uh, give, so uh, the compiler, tries to construct the proof from the program and the types because like the theory is there is very simple. So you don't need to have a human in the loop to make this additional third object, which is the proof. So compiler does that and then the compiler itself checks it. So the process of type checking in languages like Haskell or Camel is, uh, it incorporates so, to some extent a very uh, simple version of theorem proven. And the statement of theorem uh, means that the program satisfies this type. And the fact that program satisfies this type means that the program has certain properties and it doesn't go wrong. So that's a famous statement. So the well-typed programs don't go wrong. If you can assign a type to the program, it doesn't crash. So here we already have uh, industrial scale theory proven. Well, uh, type systems, they only give you very simple properties, uh, such as basic shape of your computations. But uh, in order to prove some more complex properties such as safety and temporal, something that we will probably discuss later. For that, you need to have a human in the loop. But yes, so to elaborate on what you've said, uh, theorems and programs, they are actually the two sides of the same coin. And sorry, the theorems and types, they are two sides of the same coin. And uh, proofs to theorems is the same as programs to types. So that's Gary Howard's correspondence. Of course, uh, I'd like to actually take an example uh, in order to sort of drive home this point um, and I mean I like to take an example that sort of derives maybe not derives but is related to one of the papers you published which is mechanizing blockchain consensus essentially in this paper as I understand it uh, you've uh, you've implemented a distributed consensus algorithm and the blockchain data structure and you you prove that certain properties of this blockchain network will always be met. So I'll, I'll try to take a sim simpler example, right? So when, for example, I'm a blockchain node, uh, what I'm essentially doing is I'm hearing of transactions coming into the blockchain node and these transactions are collected in a mempool. And then periodically the, the software that is running on my node uh, will compile some of these transactions into a block. Right, and it will try to add that block to the blockchain. So there is some 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 piece of software that is taking tr raw transactions and then compiling them into a block. And then this block has to be valid, right? So we might imagine that uh, we want a simple rule. The simple rule is when we are when we are doing this process of taking transactions and compiling them into a block, we don't want an older transaction which has already been confirmed on the network to be included in this in this block the the transactions ought to be unique that is a property we desire out of the node software and so our node has a previous list of transactions 
and it saw new transactions it, it was now compiled but we as these users of the software want to prove that this node running software will never create a block which repeats an older transaction and the way i understand it is like you can prove that a particular implementation that you are using will never make such a mistake using mechanized proofs is is that right yes this is this is very correct so uh let me uh just recast uh this uh, development in the light of the previous uh of the previous analogy so you have so what we did we actually defined a new set of objects objects that represent the implementation of a very very simplistic blockchain consensus protocol and the objects are essentially the execution instructions that each node can invoke uh, locally. So this is, this is what we can write statements about. So the statement that you phrased, we actually didn't prove that because that was sort of embedded by design. Uh, it, as I said, the model was uh, simplified in multiple possible ways and uh, because we were focusing on slightly more global properties. But the statement would be, here are the instructions that the node can execute. Uh, assuming that it has freedom to execute them in any order uh, so the whole thing just doesn't crash. Would it be the invariant that at any point of time the node doesn't propose a stale transaction where the stale transaction is such that has been already proposed? So this is what's called the safety property or an invariant and this is something that we can prove and the proof will, will involve case analysis and introspection on the way the semantics for these instructions is defined. So your, again, your objects are these instructions and semantics, your statement is this invariant, and the proof is something that you can write out of, out of the semantics. But you see, here's, here's an interesting point. So what we had to do is to build the whole new small theory of uh, blockchain protocol implementations. That's not granted. That's not something that we can just take from an existing implementation. So what we needed to do is to embed it into the general mathematical framework that allows to build these proofs and uh, check them mechanically. But yes, this is possible. And in fact, we focused on uh, somewhat more global properties. So what we proved is uh, an eventual consistency uh, in the form of consensus, meaning that if you are a local node and uh, you interact with other nodes, then if at some point uh, there is no communication between you and other nodes, then you know that all of you share the same knowledge of the ledger. In other words, you have reached the consensus. How did we prove it? Well, we took uh, the rules of the system and we formulated the property that implies, uh, implies this uh, agreement notion. So that's, that's the answer. So are you guys planning on like formally verifying then your actual blockchain implementation? So like I know like the smart contracting system that you guys are creating is designed to be formally verified. But uh, so similar to how Tezos is writing their entire code base in OCaml so that they can uh, formally verify the uh, code base itself. Is this something you guys are looking uh, into doing in the future or even right now? Okay, so let me uh, ask some part of this question. To verify the entire uh, infrastructure is a, a very ambitious project. So uh, that just like to give you an estimate, uh, projects of this scale, actually a smaller scale, verifying some, something like uh, mechanically defining and verifying a small OS kernel or a small compiler for a subset of C. This is something that the humanity has conducted. And that took literally uh, tens of many years. Because uh, you really, I mean, nothing is taken from granted. You need to build the whole system ground up in this framework, define the semantics of every single primitive, every single bit vector operation and whatnot, and then proof properties of that and then compositionally build, build the proofs of the entire system. So we are, we are not sure if we are planning to uh, undertake such uh, an effort right now. And furthermore, so the fact that something is written in a camel doesn't make it immediately verifiable. It makes it easier to translate into the language of theorem provers. So that's a big help, but it's not like a camel lends you some foundational uh, verification results. So uh, what, we are, what we will probably try to start from is, uh, Extending this work that uh, Meher mentioned that, we, that uh, we have done on the mechanized blockchain consensus and formulate the abstract model of Zilliqa protocol in these terms. So we at least could be sure that uh, foundationally the protocol has no uh, flaws in it. 
That doesn't mean the implementation has no bugs. That's the whole different level of complexity. And typically, it's done in several steps. So at the top level, you have your abstract specification, abs ab yeah, abstract model, and you prove some general properties thereof. And then you uh, show that your implementation, or at least some parts of it, refine parts of the abstract specification. And by means of proving this refinement, you show that actually the same properties, they are preserved. But this, this step, this is the complex part. So proving the refinement is complex, and we might be able to do it in the long run for some parts of the protocol, but not for not for all of it. And uh, that's a big thing. So as I said, nothing is taken for granted. All the crypto primitives, all the system uh, OS system interaction primitives. This is all, like if you want to have ultimate guarantees, this is also something that needs to be embedded into the proof assistant and established correct. And approving cryptographic implementations correct, that's a huge endeavor by itself. And several labs at INRE, MIT, and in there are currently taking on just to refine these libraries that implement SHA-256 and, and similar ones. So it would be good, like in the ideal world, if we could compose all these verification results together. But as always, there is, uh, there is some, ten, uh, there is some um, uh, friction on the boundary. We don't all speak the same interfaces, and it's a, it's a, big, uh, it's a big goal. So to answer the question, I think what is feasible in the medium term run is to verify the properties of model of Zilliqa, and this is what we will be probably aiming for. But Amrit might be able to elaborate on the future agenda. I'll just add one point uh, to it, which is, uh, uh, I mean, last time I talked about Zilliqa. Uh, so you, 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 have a, you have a few things in, a, in an abstract manner that you're using, right? One is proof of work, you're using PBFT, and then you're using uh, something called collective signing, which is essentially if you have uh, n people signing a message, you could reduce that to just one signature. So the signature size could be reduced from you know, linear to constant size. So you could, you could pick those pieces together. I mean, you could, you could either prove properties about those pieces individually, and then you could try to combine at an abstract level, at a very abstract level. But you know, as, as Ilya said, you know, proving properties about the implementation is, 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 another, is another thing. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll rather go with, you know, with baby steps and, and see how far we can go. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis is an open platform for businesses to create their own prediction markets on the Ethereum network. Prediction markets are powerful tools for aggregating information about the expected outcome of future events. So this can be used for things like information gathering, incentivizing behaviors, making governance decisions, or even creating insurance products. So in order to turn Gnosis into the most powerful forecasting tool in the world, they recently launched Gnosis X, it's a challenge that invites developers to build applications on top of the platform. And the best applications per category will be rewarded up to $100,000 in GNO tokens. So throughout the year, Gnosis will announce different categories for the challenge. And the current challenge has categories for science and R&D, token diligence, and blockchain project integration. Gnosis also provides the SDK, which allows you to easily get started with everything you need to get coding. And they also provide dedicated support channels throughout the challenge for teams and solo builders. Are you up for the challenge? Get started now. To learn more and to sign up, go to epicenter.tv slash Gnosis X. We'd like to thank Gnosis for their support of Epicenter. The connection to the smart contracts here is, is different. Like So uh, when you have a, a, an implementation of a blockchain node that is extremely complex and maybe like proving properties of the implementation is is like tens of man years of work. But on the other side, for smart contracts, uh, the programs might be simple enough to be amen amenable, so that amenable to proofs and the proofs might be useless. So for example, the instance I was thinking of was, there are many people that have these days crypto wealth, right? lots of crypto wealth. And presumably they might want to hand this crypto will down to the next generation in the form of a will, right? Mm -hmm. And the will can take the form of a smart contract. So there's a smart contract. I put my uh, Zilliqa tokens or Ether tokens in it. And then when I die, somebody puts in a message and then that smart contract. So when I'm alive, that smart contract allows my address to withdraw the tokens from that, uh, from that smart contract. But when somebody puts a message that I'm dead, I'm no more, then my then a different address which is controlled by let's say uh let's say my my child is then able to extract the ether or silica out of the smart contract 
so a, a small program like that a smart contract is can be really useful and the the place where mechanized proofs perhaps enters this space is if i'm going to commit lots of tokens to this smart contract well i want to know that all of this money will never get stuck in this smart contract that either me or my children will always be able to extract it right and but I, and is is it correct that uh you're focusing on mechanized proofs in the smart contract language due to like these sorts of applications in mind yes so let me let me answer that yes uh this is a fantastic summary of uh what we are trying to do so uh the properties of smart contracts which we are mostly interested in are this large scale safety and liveness property so what you've uh given as an example is a perfect case of liveness property that informally means that something good eventually happens so something good in this context means that uh a person's successors children or grandchildren will be able to cash the check uh but that might not happen right now that might not take place now uh and certain conditions need to happen for this uh for this uh, event to occur and you name this condition like somebody needs to send a sent message that a person has passed away and then uh the successor should contact with uh another sent message and what not so uh that is uh, a great example of uh, specifying this temporal property so what you just said in plain english can be uh written in terms of uh let's say a lifetime uh execution property of the smart contract so if we have smart contract and the way to uh make statements about about the way uh, uh, make the statements about how it behaves over its lifetime so what uh, changes does it make over certain conditions where does it transfer money under which condition that happens then we should be able to write this proof and this is how uh this is what we tried to build into the design of silla so that's the language whose semantics give you this notion of uh, lifetime executions of the contract so you make can make statements about them uh and you can uh, phrase the statements in the context of uh, of a proof assistant that already comes with all these foundations of silla contract execution built in so actually it knows the language that you're speaking and then uh, you you can use the machinery to write the proofs and the software will check that these proofs are Okay so in fact the property uh, like you mentioned uh, a very similar one we have proven for a model of smart contract in coq um which is which is the software for uh, for checking proofs I'll tell more about it later uh that's the property of a kickstarter contract uh which says that under certain conditions if you have backed the campaign if the campaign fails and the goal has not reached and the deadline has passed and you happen to be a backer in the past then in the future you'll be able to withdraw your money and do it exactly once so this is the kind of landless property that we want to establish and we uh in our language design helps you to do so cool so um could you tell us a little bit then about more about what are the broader design goals of uh skilla and like so you know one was easy uh transposability to cock uh another one i've noticed was a very big focus on preventing reentrancy bugs what are some of the other major design uh considerations that went into this okay so let me uh make a first step and then amrit can um uh can add more okay so uh from a general perspective i think it's very important uh to have a language that uh allows for formal certificates to be published and made available to people. So it's often the case in systems like Ethereum that the contract is compiled to bytecode and it's advertised as something that delivers certain service but essentially the clients interact with it on their own risk. So we want to reduce this risk by giving a possibility to to uh, to put formal statements and proof specifications for what contracts can and cannot do along with their proofs or some digest of the proofs. uh to to the blockchain. So this is the concept that has been studied but not in the context of blockchain. It was very popular in the late 90s. It was called proof carrying code when a certain code comes with a certain specification and the proof of the specification. So now we want to try uh to do it in practice. Uh and the big challenge here is actually to come up with useful specifications. So this is something that cannot be done automatically. So the contract might be flawed but so might be the specification. So it doesn't exp- uh, expose the flaw. So uh the big challenge 
to actually uh, provide the right logical abstractions to make statements about the contracts. But so far, we are building the language that even makes possible to specify properties like uh, Meher uh, suggested. So that is my part of the vision, and Amrit might be able to complement it with, with additional details. Yeah, so um, when we started out, you know, we, we felt that we are building a, a new blockchain platform, and um, we wanted to have a platform with smart contract features into it. Uh, but then, you know, we felt that the way smart contracts exist today, they have certain issues, and uh, you need a way to kind of improve upon them. And one way was to, you know, structure the language in a way that it, you know, you can eliminate certain certain issues directly at the language level, and also to make the language, you know, kind of proof friendly to some extent. So it becomes easier for you to to write, let's say, cock proofs, or it becomes easier for you to reason about. Uh, you know the correctness properties or safety or lightness properties about the contract. So uh, and that's why you know we were we kind of felt that you know there's there's a need to develop a new language and and this is how we started started Scylla. I see. And so uh, you mentioned it's like one of the goals is to provide a platform for uh, user or for developers to submit uh, formal proofs along with their uh, code. Um, so a couple of questions here, right? So one. It, so does that mean that the language, the code that goes on chain is uh, Scylla code rather than, so like, you know, you, you got uh, in the paper, it, sh it, it presents Scylla as this um, uh, intermediate language. So is the idea that it's this intermediate language that will be uh, pushed to the blockchain or is it uh, the lower level language? Okay, so let me take that. Uh, we were, discussing this particular design choice quite a lot. And right now the conclusion is that we want to put intermediate level language on the blockchain because we uh, value tractability, readability, and uh, possibility for formal verification more than the benefits, whatever benefits the low level representation brings. So I think there is, uh, there is a certain bias in the community uh, since, uh, uh, since Ethereum was very, very extremely successful. Uh, as an implementation uh, of a smart contract platform, uh, that uh, a very low level representation should go there because that's probably efficient to store, that's efficient to execute. But, well, EVM is not what actually uh, executed per se in most of Ethereum clients. So it's jitted down to some low level architecture uh, so it could run faster. So if we do that with supposedly low level EVM, so why can't we just take a slightly higher level language and compile it as we process the block that comes down? So we are not particularly concerned with uh, efficiency because that's going to be compiled down to something low level. And tractability is the main concern. That's why we are going to put the intermediate level language, i.e. Scylla. If, if I may just add to, to this, you know, if, if you look at certain auditing uh, you know, tools or services that exist right now, if, if you look at the smart contract that's going on the blockchain, it's in the bytecode. And then if you want to audit it, it becomes very difficult. You either need to decompile it or deassemble it or you know, figure out a way to, to, to manage it in human terms. Um, but if you, have, if you have an intermediate representation that actually speaks uh, you know, the logic that you, the, the contract actually implements, it becomes much easier to understand what the contract is actually doing. Uh, rather than uh, you know, putting a bytecode on the, on the blockchain and then separately publishing the the source code somewhere else. So I, th I think it's, it's better. I mean, of course, there are certain trade-offs that you'll have to play around with. But uh, to, to, because we are targeting security, I, we felt that it's, it's, it's a better idea to actually go with the uh, Scylla kind of representation directly on the blockchain. Yeah, I mean, this is always one of like the very like weird things I found about Ethereum, where you know on the blockchain, all there is is that EVM bytecode. And then whenever people want to look at the actual Solidity code, Basically, the default is just to go to uh, Etherscan and look at the Solidity bytecode there, and you know I, that's a very like centralized thing that maybe we don't want to like. We we want something that's more accessible in a decentralized way. Yeah, right. So actually, like this this sort of brings an imagination in into my head, and I'm going to play out that imagination to sort of sketch out the vision. Your what I think the the vision you're building towards is. So today, if I'm a smart contract user, right? And let's say I'm going to use a multi-signature contract, right? And I'm going to put money into this multi-signature contract. Well, before putting money into the multi-signature contract, a power user like me wants to know if that contract is security audited, right? 
and I, then I'll go to this probably this audit from least authority or trail of bits or something like that and I'll read the audit report and then if the auditors say good things about the contract then I'll end up committing money to it but somehow somehow in this process I'm trusting the judgment of the auditor right so the program I'm the programmer wrote the contract and then the auditor audited it and I'm trusting the combination of the judgments of these two people in deciding that this contract is is safe so what you seem to be building towards is like 10 years later in when i when i see a multi signature contract i will go to the contract and then linked to the contract will be a set of mathematical proofs that my browser can verify mechanically and these mathematical proofs will ensure that large chunks of the functionality of that multi signature contract are correct from a mathematical proof perspective i do not need to rely on the judgment of a human security auditor in order to be sure that this multi sig contract is is okay and sort of skilla is sort of your way of building a language that allows this future to come about that is correct so instead of trusting the human auditor you will be trusting the cold-hearted, soulless machine that takes the specification, the contract, and the proof and checks them. And I hope it didn't come out bad. It's not like we are trying to take out people's job. Rather, <laughs> we will build a new generation of uh, well, new opportunities for job because someone will actually have to write those proofs. Uh, as I said, like uh, automate, like full automation is hardly possible, and that requires uh, trained qualified mathematicians and formal method experts to conduct some of those proofs. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's essentially is the vision. So the devil is in the details. Uh, when we say correct, we usually don't specify correct in which meaning. So uh, the most critical part of this thing is actually to come up with the right specification. And this is something that we don't have the ultimate answer for because it's very much domain specific. You came up uh, with the specification for this wheel transfer and contract, which was quite good. Was it the, the complete specification for this contract? Well, I'm not sure. I think we'll still need human auditors who will come up with the right specifications so the provers could prove them and then all will be safely put onto the blockchain and the machines could check that the proofs are good. But I don't think we are at the stage when the specifications can be derived uh, automatically. I think this is what we need humans for. Yeah, if, 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 if I just may add one point to this, which is, uh, you know, if if we open this up you know, at the community level, you know, you could say that look, here is, uh, I mean, this is how ERC twenty standards came out, right? You know, people came up with an idea as a draft, and then you know, people started vetting for it, and then realized that okay, these are the functionalities or specifications we desire from from an ERC twenty kind of contract, and uh, then you know, you had this all these functions and interfaces that came out. So you could you could have something along those lines here as well. So you could say that look, um, now that ERC twenty kind of contract has been established. Uh, the standard has been established. Now, what are the properties that you're actually seeking? So, you know, you could say that I want my money to be, you know, when I when I make a transfer, I want to ensure that the, you know, the right amount gets transferred. Or if the mapping is, if the ERC20 contract maintains a mapping, that mapping doesn't get manipulated or, you know, changed, gets changed over time. So, you know, you could have another, you know, another line of this vetting process where a community can jump in and say, here, is the, here are the properties that we expect. Uh, this contract to have and then you could have another human people who would who would come in and say look here is a proof that that i i, I have come up with can you vet vet this proof so you know it, it goes to another level where you are not just building standard for for contracts but you're building standards for proofs for instance and properties so like you said the at the moment uh the process of generating these proofs is a very like human intensive process and it, it, it like like you said it, you almost need like trained mathematicians to do this so do you think this would cause like a lot of people to um not even like go through this process um so for example like you know in ethereum there are some very like you know some decent tools like like for very very preliminary checking such as like oyente and stuff uh by, by your colleague at uh lawyer actually right and um but you know, there are so many contracts on Ethereum that are like vulnerable to things that Oyente would have easily picked up. And so if it's like smart contract developers aren't even taking the time to like, Oyente is literally like a one-click thing. 
uh, but still so many people aren't even taking the time to do that. Uh, how do you how do we uh, encourage developers and uh, to like go through this like rigorous formal verification process? So uh, this is actually well known uh, trade off in not just in the contract uh, engineering. It's a well known trade off in software engineering as well, and where the community has spent the last five decades building tools for testing, analysis, and verification. So by no means uh, verification is the ultimate question that solves uh, like all possible issues. And one issue is the issue of how difficult is it to adopt the approach. So um, even though we designed this whole language so it would be verification friendly, uh, we will sure provide the suite for uh, basic analysis and basic testing of the contract. So this is sort of the light way to uh, validate your code base, the same way that the developers validate the code they write in other in other domains, like okay, so you can verify the compiler, but then you will spend ten years doing that, or you can just implement the compiler and test it and have a ninety nine percent assurance that it's uh, mostly bug free. Uh, and if these are the chances you are willing to take, well, we'll give you the tools for that. So, like one easy, uh, relatively easy to implement analysis that is in our roadmap is to make sure that the contract doesn't doesn't leak money. So, uh, with uh, colleagues from NUS, we have recently. Uh, submitted, uh, okay, so we made it public, it's not published at the conference, yes, the paper that uh, has an analysis for EVM that the text with a high degree of assurance that the certain contract might actually block money the same way Parity Wallet did that, or it might give money to someone who is not supposed to receive that. And we are planning to build the same uh, analyzers for SIL as well. And as the second part, we will probably make this analy um, analyzer certifying. So for a property as generic, and as simple as the contract doesn't leak money, we actually don't have to, we will not have, we will not need to have trained proof engineers to prove that. So there will be two that will be checking that and providing this certificate. But that's, again, okay, that's only again because the property is very basic and the property is very simple. Like the property of this will transfer and contract is something very domain specific and that probably will require uh, a certain amount of uh, human effort to deliver it. But that's like with higher assurance comes higher cost of verification. So dumb properties you can prove almost for free, complicated ones you will need to invest. Uh, the, the other point that I would like to add to this is, uh, if you look at uh, the applications or the contracts that actually exist right now on, on popular blockchain platforms like Ethereum, they can be categorized into very popular ones and not so popular ones. And those who are, which are very popular ones, which are essentially let's say ERC20 kind of contract or exchanges or you know some very auctions uh, and for that, you could have templates the way you have templates for ERC20. So you could say that here is how an ERC20 contract should look like. And here are the possible properties that you may want to prove on this contract. And then you could have associated proof directly, either coming from, let's say, you know, the, the open community that we have or from, from anyone who has, who has experience in, in, in developing core proofs. The hard way which no one wants is, is to impose developer to submit a contract in that, that, that you, you cannot submit a contract without actually having a proof. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be really cruel, I would say, um, <laughs> for, for anyone. Because uh, maybe you are very familiar with JavaScript or Solidity or Scylla, but you may not be very, very familiar with cock proofs. So even if you want to do this, you, know, you, you, you are still you know, reluctant to do, you know, in doing this, because then you will really push away those developers who actually have very cool ideas. But just because they, don't have, they are not familiar with cock proofs, you know, they, they can't build on you. So yeah, we will help have helper libraries uh, for standard contracts, and we'll have some, you know, basic properties that you can always prove for any contract, for instance. And then if you are, if you know, if, if you're a cock, cock specialist, you know, feel free to write your own contract and uh, your own properties and on your own proofs. Okay, let's first talk about what cock is, because we have mentioned this uh, cock tool multiple times in the podcast, and Ilya, give us an idea what it can do. Okay, so if the question is about a very short overview of what the tool can do or what it was designed for. So uh, the tool is actually uh, uh, verbatim, okay, it, first of all, it's very old and it's very established. So it's uh, started in uh, late 80s. And it has been mostly a tremendous success in the past, let's say, 12, 13 years. Uh, so but initially it was almost a verbatim implementation of one of those 
very powerful logics to conduct mathematical proofs. The logic is called cal calculus of inductive construction. And then it was extended a number of times. Uh, but uh, because of this correspondence uh, between proofs and the programs, it turns out that Koch also comes with a very decent programming language. It's not too incomplete. Uh, you cannot write non-terminating loops in it. But you can write surprisingly many uh, interesting and useful programs. So pretty much anything you can come up with. Well, anything that uh, probably terminates. And then uh, it turned out to be the case that uh, in the very same environment, you can write programs. And you can write mathematical statements about them. And you can write proofs. So all these uh, three components that I mentioned before, they can be implemented in the same framework. Uh, and that was a very powerful insight. And since then, people wrote compilers in Coke which we are also verified in Coke. That's a famous Comsort project by Inri and Xavier Leroy, who was spearheading it. Uh, and they wrote OS kernels, and uh, to the extent that people even wrote distributed systems in Coke. Uh, and it's interesting, because um, obviously Coke doesn't come equipped with all the distributed uh, socket machinery and all the backend. So and there is a certain level of trust involved. So what you uh, write in Coke is the logic of uh, nodes. And then you trust that the network implementation is correct uh, and it corresponds to what is your mathematical model of this network implementation. But that is just all to witness that Coke is very, very powerful. And from like, if you're a programmer and you look at it, the code looks very much similar to code in languages such as OCaml. So it's a functional programming language. You can recognize uh, similar libraries, similar primitives. So if you actually want to write something in Coke that compiles and runs, you don't even need to know about its uh, proof component. It's fairly, yeah, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and that, uh, okay, I have quite a number of years of experience with Coke. I used it for proving distributed systems correct and con concurrent systems correct. And that seems like a natural choice to adopt. So uh, essentially, we designed uh, Scylla to incorporate a significant subset of Coke and add slightly more on top of it to account for the blockchain specifics and um, uh, communication between the contracts. But if you look at uh, most of the Scylla code, it will look very similar to a subset of Coke code, and that's why it's so easy to translate Scylla to Coke and proofs uh, and prove facts about it. So um, we've been mentioning a lot about like you know OCaml and Haskell and these like uh, more established uh, functional languages that are also design or, or not designed perhaps but are easier to uh, translate to cock right um, so what made you guys decide to create your own language rather than try to adapt the existing languages so for example you know one of the things that was happening you know ethereum when it created the evm it decided to create its own smart contract languages like solidity and stuff and now you know I, it seems to me that there's a general sentiment that like you know why did we go at, like, we shouldn't have gone and like created our own languages because now we have to create all the toolings around it. And this is sort of what some of the hype around WebAssembly is becoming, where it's like, oh, this is awesome. We can use the more established tooling around Rust and Go and C++. Um, so did you got, what were some of the trade-offs you guys had to make on like, between using more established systems languages versus building your own? All right, so the process of designing a programming language is a series of very, very painful trade-offs. Uh, and the trade-offs that we had to consider is uh, expressivity versus tractability. So Haskell and OCaml, OK, let me focus on functional languages because those are closer to mathematics. And that's the reason why there is a lot of hype in the smart contract community about how uh, smart contracts should be written in functional paradigm. So they are fantastic languages. They are very expressive, and you can express uh, a lot of computation in a very few lines of code. But that comes with the cost, that uh, the semantics uh, of Haskell and semantics of OCaml, that is what the programmers need to know in order to write programs in them, it's very big. And uh, it makes it very costly to embed this language in a formal uh, reasoning framework, such as Coq. So in this way, uh, there was an, so essentially the, the rationale was to scale down to the bare set of features that are required to write reasonable smart contracts, keep it readable, but do not add stuff on top, something like syntactic sugar, something like type class operators, what Haskell has, um, type kind polymorphism, and all these crazy goodies that dedicated Haskell hackers use. So that's, that's rationale. So we wanted to have a minimalistic calculus. And this is essentially how the basic research in programming languages goes. So if you want to have a formal 
uh, system about which you can prove things, you try to remove all the goodies that actually make programmers' life easier. And this is why we position this as an intermediate level language. So we don't exclude the fact that something like a very large subset of OCaml and Haskell can be translated down to Scylla when we come to this point. But we won't be proving stuff about these top level programs. We will be proving stuff about the programs that are uh, that are represented in Scylla. So again, the trade of expressivity versus uh, tractability for, for the sake of formal reason. So in a sense, the, the more expressive the semantics, the more the range of things programmers, range of basic constructs the programmers can use in writing a program, the more expressive a language it, it is, the harder it would be to prove properties uh, about the programs that, that result out of it. And in and Scylla is meant to be meant to have very little expressivity, but amenable to proofs. And then in the future, presumably somebody could write in OCaml, uh, have it compiled down to Scylla, and then prove properties about the code uh, uh, in 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 this in Scylla. That is correct. Okay. So uh, we have a, we have around like fifteen minutes left, and uh, one of the things we'd like to focus on and understand is how does Scylla compare to other efforts that are going on you know, in the formal verification and smart contract space? So of course, like this idea that smart contracts ought to have proofs and the need to design languages so that uh, theorem proving is easy has been taken up with by other projects. And one of the most popular, at least in terms of funding levels is is the Tezos project which has developed this language called uh, Mikkelsen or Michelson uh, which seems to have very similar aims to Scylla. Could you, could you give us an idea of how the Tezos approach and the Scylla approach might be similar and how they might be different? All right, so the question is about uh, Mikkelsen language and Tezos and, uh, and our Scylla. Yes, uh, so uh, the design goals are very similar uh, in a sense that both uh, Tezos community and us are very much interested in uh, formal verification of rigorously stated properties of the contracts. Uh, furthermore, we share a lot of background because Tezos comes from OCaml Labs and most of the OCaml Labs employees, well, specifically uh, Benjamin Kanu and Arthur Breitman, who were one of the founders, they all come with solid OCaml background and formal methods background, so it would, it's quite unsurprising that they are after the same thing. I think the, and, and they also are functional programmers. So Mikkelson is very much a functional programming, uh, functional programming language. So the devil is in the details. So uh, for some reason, Mikkelson was designed as a stack-based um, stack language, something that uh, mimics uh, EVM or similar formalism closely, but it is not yet clear what are the trade-offs uh, with regard to the formal verification. So one of the claims that uh, the interpreter for this stack-based formalism is actually quite simple and it can be fully embedded in Coke. Well, I wouldn't say that the interpreter for Scylla is uh, much more difficult, but a reason about the stack is not something very natural. So that said, we haven't seen that many proofs about uh, Tezos contracts. So it's, uh, it's hard to have an apples to apples comparison uh, and see what the Coke embedding or, of uh, let's say, uh, a crowdfunding, a Kickstarter contract in Tezos uh, in Mikkelson would, would be like, and how the proofs compare in terms of length. So this is ultimately goes to benchmarking the, the proof sizes and, see, and, and checking whose proofs are larger or not, since they don't have them yet, they might have them soon, that will be, that will be good. So uh, in fact, the, okay, so the idea of having this low-level stack-based based language uh, in Mikkelson led to the second development, and now they have liquidity, which is a more high-level language which is actually quite similar to Scylla in the sense that it also looks like a subset of a camel and it has very similar uh, functional programming primitives. The thing which uh, is missing from there, or maybe it was a design choice, is the explicit communication between the contracts in the sense that each contract is kind of this sealed autonomous actor that only receives the messages from other contracts and send messages to other contracts. And this is only the way for the contracts to interact on the blockchain. So this is something that Scylla as a language enforces syntactically. So you, like, if you write a contract, it's going to be shaped 
as this actor that receives messages and sends messages. So it's not enforced in liquidity, neither it is in Mikkelson. And that's why uh, I can only speculate that stating properties like what we discussed before about this uh, passing will in the future is going to be uh, a bit more complicated should they have a formal, a formal model of, uh, of liquidity somewhere in Coq. So yeah, so basically the, the, the main difference is that uh, liquidity slash Mikkelson don't have the, this um, actor message passing model enforced at the language level. And the second is uh, Mikkelson is tech based, which makes it uh, slightly more low level than, than Stella. If I just may add to one uh, point, uh, uh, which is, if, if you look at, I mean, since you're talking about other languages, uh, we, should, we should talk about uh, this language uh, from Ethereum, which is Bamboo. Um, and uh, again, again, the idea was uh, with Bamboo is, is the trade off between expressivity and, and the properties or the correctness, safety, and properties that you can prove about, about um, the contract. So I would say that it's, it's, uh, Bamboo is another language which is uh, less expressive to some extent, uh, but it's more structured in the sense that what they call you know, polymorphic contracts. And the idea is that you know, the contract gives you a rigid structure and it tells you uh, how the contract will change itself. Uh, depending on how users are interacting with it. So instead of having five, let's say five functions or five transitions in your contract, you would have one contract and then another contract and then another contract. And this contract will eventually change depending on how users interact with this contract. So it, it has a very predefined kind of behavior to some extent, how this contract will behave. So I, I feel that you know, it's, um, the idea that we are doing in Sela is, is pretty, pretty close to, I mean, uh, Ilya will be able to elaborate more on this. But I feel that uh, ba Bamboo is, has some elements that uh, Sila, Sila has as well, uh, to, to some extent. That's correct. Another um, kind of important uh, difference I saw I noticed as well was that in uh, Mickelson, there seems to be a focus on making it purely functional, while uh, in Scylla, there is this ability to have like some sort of state that you that functions are allowed to modify. Uh, and what were some of the uh, trade offs you did? On, on making that decision. Okay, so the question is why still is not purely functional while Mikkelson and liquidity seem to be purely functional. So uh, this is actually uh, an interesting question because uh, it very much uh, comes down to the terminology of what you count as a functional and what you count as an imperative language. So uh, both Scylla and Mikkelson have state. Uh, but in uh, Mikkelson, this state or liquidity, which makes it even more explicit, this state is made explicit. So uh, basically, you pass this state around, uh, like accumulating certain components to it, and you can even ship it to another contract, and you can get it back from another contract, and then you can finally give it back to the blockchain backend that will probably store it. So uh, this uh, is probably the level of... Um, verbosity that we wanted to exclude. I mean, I said that we all for taking minimalistic choices, but having a state that the contract modifies seems so paramount and so important that we decided, okay, so we are going to have state, we are going to have very small set of operators that interact with this state, and well, and state is something like this, 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 this sort of mutable a state is something that formal methods community knows how to deal with. So there are many uh, verifiers, there are many program logics uh, that can prove automatically the effects of program interacting with the state. So we didn't really see the benefit of making it absolutely pure functional. And to this extent, uh, Scylla also has uh, a bunch of other effects that are uh, expressed in the semantics. So in addition to changing state, we also have sending messages, and in the future we will have emitting events. So uh, making these things part of the execution was important and obviously you can model all of that through some state passing mechanism but we thought that for the way for writing certain specifications it will be better to uh, implement them the way we did. So bottom line, most of the state manipulation you can do in Scylla, you can encode in Tezos, uh, in, in Tezos Mikkelson as well, it's going to be less straightforward and it's at the moment it's not clear whether it's going to be exploitable in a certain way or not. As I said, since uh, Mikkelson uh, implements interaction between the contracts using this state passing mechanism rather than by uh, sending messages, uh, the implications are not clear. So another question then, uh, maybe somewhat related, is 
you know, we discussed earlier one of the other main features of the Zillica platform is the whole whole sharding uh, mechanism. So what were some of the uh, design choices that went into the uh, language as well as the overall VM design uh, that were like, you know, one of the big things that people often want need with sharding is you need the ability to do like asynchronous contract calls and stuff. Um, and so what were some of the thought process of like sharding that went into the design of this system? I mean, for instance, to start with, uh, we don't have an EVM the way a VM the way EVM Ethereum has a VM, right? We are currently have we currently have an interpreter that takes Scylla contract interprets us essentially. Uh, now the problem is uh, you know you you have a sharded architecture and you need a way to kind of as you said you know to to pass messages in a, in an asynchronous manner. So it's um, it's uh, it's a work in progress where uh, there are three different angles that we're exploring right now. Uh, one is can you ensure that um, all tran all transactions that somehow you know, maybe in conflict because they are touching the same state or reading from the same state or manipulating the same state, get sharded to the same shard. So this is this is one idea. If if you can do that, then you know you can eliminate you know certain issues that you know you're talking about, you are hinting at. The other idea is that can you actually have some kind of a language support, which Ilya would be able to elaborate on? Can you have some 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 level at the language which allows you to kind of merge certain transactions going in different shards? And, and there is, could be other ideas, for instance, can you have some kind of a conflict detect, detector or resolver somewhere in the architecture that helps you, helps you, those, you know, solve those problems. So we are, we are currently actively exploring all these three, three you know, directions, and um, we have plans to write a paper around this, which we'll be happy to uh, you know, make it public very soon. So um, what we'd like to get a sense of is, what is the current state of development of Scylla? And what can the community expect to see in, in the form of releases over the next six months? So uh, what, what we have right now is, um, is an interpreter that uh, it's not complete, of course. Uh, it's still work in progress. But it is, uh, it's, it is in a stage where we can, write, we can still write some interesting contracts. So um, we had an example uh, in the Scylla white paper initially, uh, the Kickstarter contract. So that contract can be interpreted by, by our interpreter right now. So we have that support ready. Uh, there are some other examples that we are currently working on. Uh, we, will, we are working on examples like ERC-20, uh, ERC-721. So um, the, the interpreter is in a stage where it can, can handle certain contracts. It cannot handle all contracts that, that we would imagine right now. For instance, it doesn't have certain supports for certain data structures, uh, uh, for instance. Uh, but we do have, um, we do have a working prototype where you know, a user can deploy a contract to the Zilliqa network, and the Zilliqa network, a node in the Zilliqa network, can actually run that contract and uh, commit the state to the blockchain, and you know the entire chain is ready. Uh, our plan is to have uh, the complete uh, implement, you know, implementation of the interpreter ready by end of June, uh, when we are planning to have our second version of the testnet, where we we have plans to you know to show to people, you know, here is how um, Scylla looks like. And you can play around with uh, with uh, contracts. Uh, let me add uh, to that. So on the verification side, we also have the prototype implementation of Scylla in Coq, which is done by means of uh, what's called shallow embedding. So essentially, instead of implementing the whole language interpreter in Coq, we uh, only implement those primitives that Coq doesn't have. And since there is a lot of uh, shared parts between the syntax, the rest is taken from Coq verbatim. And in this uh, prototype, uh, we can prove the properties like what we've discussed. And the very same Kickstarter contract is implemented in this, uh, in this formalism and the properties are established. What is missing though, is the connecting link between what runs on the blockchain and what is formalized in Coq. So that can be done by syntactic translation. This is something that we will uh, provide, provide very, very soon. So you could write your contract in Scylla, then it gets extracted to Coq. There you prove the properties, you know that it's right, and then you can go back to your um, implementation and run it on the uh, on Zilliqa blockchain. Cool. We, we look forward to uh, the, the releases, especially in the, in the next version of the testnet, if uh, people are able to deploy basic Scylla contracts, that would be pretty, pretty cool. We look forward to that. So Amrit and Ilya, it was a pleasure to have you on the show and we hope we'll catch up 
again on Scylla and Zilliqa six months down the line when when there's there's more to report. Especially maybe what might be interesting is to discuss the interaction of programming languages and sharding uh, in, your, in your paper there. Uh, Zilliqa always remains one of the projects I, I, I closely follow. So uh, I'm really looking forward to what comes out of this project when it goes into the mainnet. So for our listeners, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as you know, we release new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Tuesday. You can subscribe to iTunes, SoundCloud or your favorite podcast app for iOS and Android to keep up to date with Epicenter. You can watch the video version of this show on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. Also, we've recently created a Gitter community where you can chat with us and other Epicenter listeners at epicenter.tv slash Gitter. I find that the conversations here are, are very intellectual because of the nature of the community we have, we have built. So check our Gitter channel out. And of course, uh, your reviews and your feedback on Twitter and iTunes is very valuable to us and it keeps us going. So support the show with leaving us a review on iTunes. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you for listening.